welcome to those online who are joining us. Uh, for those who are online, um, you've probably picked up already that this is part of a, a, a weekend really set apart of prayer and fasting. And so there's a great sense of anticipation. I'm sort of standing here and I'm a bit wobbly actually. <laughs> I, I, it's almost like God's unstabilizing us and turning us, into a diff- turning us around to a different axis that there's a big change. But I just want to say if you're online and you're feeling that or if you're in this room and you're feeling that, uh, let's go with that because I actually believe that this is God at work. That God is doing something significant to us, and I don't know what's going to happen really in, in this preach, um, but I've tried to be obedient as much as I can to what God's saying. So let's trust him that he will work through this and ongoing in this time together and in the days ahead. I just think there's something that has changed from this point on. So we're going to see evidence of that, I'm sure. So what we're doing is we're talking about a really key thing today. It's the king and his kingdom. And it actually just fell beautifully together, this, because I'm talking about the incarnation of the king, which is the coming of the king. So we get today to celebrate the coming of the king. Uh, We've heard that we've had the king in town, as in Milton Keynes. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Just a a short while ago, the King of England. Um, But I'm going to start with a different story. Um, As part of the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis, that amazing, um, amazing writer, tells the story of someone called Prince Caspian. For those who've read it, and for those who haven't, Prince Caspian was born the rightful heir to the throne. But there was a usurper called King Miraz who seized power and controlled Caspian. Kept him on, a bit like a puppet almost, but just there, kept him going. Now, Miraz had oppressed and driven away all of the talking creatures and the magical beings, and had denied all of the old ways. On the occasion of King Miraz and his wife having a son, Prince Caspian is urgently forced to flee for his life because he is no longer needed, and so he's going to get killed, and he runs for his life. And this whole book is C.S. Lewis... uh, really massive tale of the adventures and battles for Prince Caspian to come to rule as a son of Adam in his kingdom under the great king, the lion Aslan. It's a really big story and it's got great sacrifice in it and it's the fourth book in this seven book series. So today we're actually looking at a small story in some senses, a small story chronologically but it's an amazingly big story with amazingly big consequences. And so in our section of this big story of the king and his kingdom, we're going to see that a baby is born, and literally all of heaven breaks loose. Now the storyline, we need to say this right up front, is so familiar because of numerous Christmas productions that we have almost become, can I say this, a little bit desensitized to this? A little bit desensitized to the radical, the outrageous, the unthinkable reality that we're going to look at. Think about it. God becoming a baby. That's radical. It's radical. Isn't it? It's just right out there. It's outrageous. We, you know, if we didn't have the Christmas story and that narrative every Christmas time, our minds wouldn't get hold of that. It's such a radical thing. Chronologically, our story is completed in a few short months, but the repercussions literally will tilt eternity to a new axis. This is where we are. So in our story, this all fits together. This is my little bit of a story, but it fits together in this big story of the king and his kingdom that we've been looking at. And hasn't this been great to go deep dive into this, to look at some of these areas? And so what we've seen is we've seen things like how we were designed for oneness under this theocracy right at the beginning. Theocracy just means God's in charge, God's king, God's ruling. And in that, we had this thing called the great separation, where we decided we didn't want God to be in charge, and we did our own thing. And that happened, of course, in the Garden of Eden. And then what happened was that God got involved in the people with a covenant community. So God, as it were, ran after us and reached out with covenant and said, listen, I'm going to be with you. I will be your God. You'll be my people. And he reached out to them, even though they were running away from him and said, we're not going to have anything to do with you. The people in time decided that they didn't want that. They still didn't want God to rule over them in that way. And what they did was they said, we want to have a king like other nations. And then we moved into this period of monarchy, monarchy where you have men on the throne. People are king. 
And now what we're doing is we're now changing gear and we're moving into a completely new epoch. We're moving into this area called Christocracy, theocracy. It's actually theocracy by another name. God is king, but it's called Christocracy because Christ is king. Christ is king, and of course, Christ is God. Well, we know that now, don't we? Because we know the story. But that's where we're coming into today. And as it starts in Matthew 1 1, which is the start of the New Testament. And so we've got this amazing build up to this, which is what we had last week. And didn't that work so well last week? It was just amazing listening to Liesl just tempting us with this promise. There's a king coming. There's a king coming. There's a king coming. The promise of the king that will transform and change everything. Well, we're here. This is the incarnation of the king. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, we know all of this story. What would happen, though, was unexpected to many. So put into historical context, it was unexpected to many. You see, some anticipated a warrior messiah. That meant the anointed one. It was just a Jewish term for the one who would be anointed as king. Actually, we still do that. When Charles becomes king, he will be anointed, which is actually a reflection of how it was done biblically, the anointed one. So what happens is that the warrior Messiah, the anointed one, as God's representative, would lead the nation, they thought, to victory over their enemies. He'd come to stamp his foot on the enemies of Israel. Many others expected a deliverer God to come in power with like shock and awe type tactics. What actually happened, though, was that God didn't just come. He was born. I want to just think about that for a moment. God didn't just come out of heaven with a visit card and say, here I am. God didn't do that. God was born. See how shocking that is. God was born. Now, a few weeks ago, I I said that we couldn't understand a particular verse before looking at this whole story. Let's look again at this verse now. It's from the prophet Isaiah. It was about 700 years before the time of Jesus that Isaiah said this. And let's see the significance of this. It says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, firstly, Isaiah here, the prophet, was speaking to King Ahaz. Ahaz was a descendant of King David. Now, that should prick our ears. Descendant of King David. And he was of the royal household, therefore, of David. Now, this prophecy is a message about a future kingdom. Then this verse is also, as it says there, a direct sign from God. So this isn't, well, something's just going to happen. No, this is God is going to do something. This is God's intervention. He's going to do something. This is going to be God's sign. And the direct sign is that a virgin of the house of David will become pregnant to give birth to a son. Now imagine, or is it just me, that Ahaz's jaw would hit the floor at this point. I mean, how often does that happen? Exactly. You see, this is just impossible without God. But isn't that the point? Then the prophet says that the name given to this son will be described as Emmanuel. Now, many of us know someone called Emmanuel. We may even be called Emmanuel. It's, it's a fairly common name, isn't it, these days? It's a fairly common name. However, in the Bible, that name is actually unique. It occurs here and also, get this, in Matthew 1, 23, when the verse is quoted about Jesus. So there, this applies to no one else. It's said here about Jesus, and in Matthew it says, this is it. This is the one coming, this is him. Do you get that? It's so unique. Emmanuel actually is therefore so significant. It's a composite Hebrew name of Immanu, and that means, as it says there, you can see behind me, it says, with us, and El meaning God. So put together, it just means God with us. So what happened as a baby? God with us. Let's look at this story. I'm going to, I could take Matthew, but let's go to the Gospel of John. I just want to um, read some of this. It's some of the most beautiful words, I think, that are in the Bible. They're amazing, this. It's the prologue 
of the Gospel of John. And it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Do you get the emphasis here on Him? In other words, He didn't just visit, He came, a baby. And what happens, it says, in him was life, and the light, life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness hasn't overcome it. The true light, verse 9, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, to his own people, that's to the Jews, but his own people did not receive him. But to those who did receive him... To everyone who did receive him, that's everyone who received him, by the way, there. To everyone who received him, <laughs> okay, we're all included in that, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, now if you think that God coming as a baby is like amazing radical fact number one, what about amazing radical fact number two, that we can become children of God? Or does that only blow my mind? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the only God who's at the Father's side has made him known. Three things that we're going to look at here briefly. First of all, that through the coming of the baby, God is speaking. John chooses his words so carefully here. These words are actually like the beginning of the entire King and His Kingdom story. We, it's almost like we've skipped all the way back to Genesis 1-1 here, isn't it? And we're hearing again, in the beginning. What does John say? In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, Genesis 1 was God. So in the beginning, it's exactly the same. And what it says when everything was made, when God said, let there be light, and there was light, as in Genesis 1-3, straight away we're introduced here to the Word, who is the Lord God, who created all things, who is the source of all life to men, as in Genesis 2, the Lord God formed the dust of man from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is exactly the same here in this prologue from John's Gospel. And the man became a living creature. The Word accomplishes all of God's work. God doesn't do anything except by his word. And here is the word. And what's powerful here is that God is speaking in the word. Just by God's words, all things were created. So why is that important, therefore, to our story? Well, when I spoke last time on the great separation, who remembers the question that the serpent said to Adam and Eve? Did God say? Okay. It went on a bit from that, but let's start with that. Did God say? Three really, 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 really important words. Did God say? What's the big question? Did God say? What's the big question again? Did God say? What's happening here? God is saying by his word. God is saying by his word. Secondly, What's happening here is their response, Adam and Eve's response, led to no longer hearing the audible voice of God regularly. Remember, they used to walk with God in the cool of the day, used to talk with God in the cool of the day. But what happened when God called them? They hid. All right, I'm not going to re-preach that, but they hid. Remember, they hid. They hid from him. They hid from his voice. They hid. So their response led to the voice of God becoming rare, it talks about in the Bible. And what from that moment on, the voice of God wasn't heard regularly. Certain individuals, community patriarchs, and then prophets in particular hear God, but that's often actually through dreams and, and visions, and very rarely is God spoken to face to face. Moses gets very close to that, and some of the other prophets get very close, but very rarely does that happen, certainly not on a general basis. It's where like God's hidden away. He's protected by temples, tabernacles, tents in the wilderness, and no one can have access to him and hear his voice directly. Remember that 
in the Christmas story that we all know so well. What do you have there? Well, you have visions, you have signs, you have big star in the sky, you've got angelic visitations, you've got all of this stuff, dreams, you've, all of this stuff happens, but that's all of the revelation, of, as it were, that had been over that period summed up, all of that kickstart. Now, what happens, though, prior to Jesus coming is also interesting. The Old Testament, as we call it, ends in the book of Malachi. And the book of Malachi, if you glance there, you'll see it. It's there. Malachi spoke about 400 years before Jesus came. 400 years, and then guess what? Radio silence. There's no prophet speaking. There's no current word of the Lord. Just flat line on the radio. White noise. Nothing from heaven. Nothing new from heaven. The nation is starved of any fresh sound until now. And then this is the first sound that we hear from God. You're allowed to smile. We can have fun. Okay, I was a bit naughty. The Christmas carol says that no crying he made. However, he came and he was clothed in flesh, and flesh cries. Flesh cries. And I think that's really significant that the first sound from heaven is a cry. And that wrecks me a bit, actually. See, certainly Jesus would later weep at the death of a friend. He'd also weep over Jerusalem, as we're going to see a little bit later on in this preach. And when the author was praying to the Father, the book of Hebrews says that behind the scenes, God, he, he, Jesus would often intercede with tears. That it would actually be his regular Thing. When Jesus went alone to pray, there would frequently be tears. Now, note that the word is coming into the world from the beginning. Another thing of the uniqueness of Jesus' birth was not only that he was born from a virgin, but that also that he didn't originate at his birth. I originated, like most of you did, <laughs> at the point in which we were, we were conceived, really, And then beyond that, to the point in which we were born. But Jesus wasn't like that. He existed before he was born, before he was placed in a manger. The personhood, the character, the personality of Jesus existed before the man Jesus was born. Now, the theological word to describe this mystery isn't creation, because Jesus wasn't created. The theological word to describe this mystery is incarnation which is actually the word we've used, the incarnation of the king. An incarnation is accurate because what that means, it means that, the, that God became incarnate or clothed in flesh. You see, the person, not the body, but the essential personhood of Jesus existed before he was born as a man. His birth was not the coming into being of a new person, but the coming into the world of an infinitely old person infinitely old person. Micah 5.2 puts it like this, 700 years before Jesus was born, but you, O Bethlehem Epaphrathah, this is the one we often quote, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth the one who is the ruler of Israel, who is coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Jesus came from ancient days days so that's the first thing God speaks God speaks and I believe that God is speaking to us as a church I believe that God is speaking to those who are online who are gathered with us today and I believe we're in the process of hearing him right now secondly 
through our story that we're looking at today, God is with us. In verse 14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, the word dwelt literally means tabernacled or set up his tent among us. It's got an echo here of some of the stories where the tabernacle was the place where God would be among his people in the covenant community. It's all there. It was the place where the abiding glory of God was present among the people, but hidden from view. Now, in John's analogy, Jesus is now wrapped in flesh. So just as a a tent wraps around, Jesus is now wrapped in flesh. And he's wrapped in flesh so that they can see him face to face. As John goes on to say, we have seen his glory that... Now, that is a radical statement in itself. You just think, oh, that sounds nice. No, no, no. No one can see God and live. It also says that in the Bible. So this is how do we manage to see God because he's wrapped in flesh. Okay, that's a different preach. I'm not going there. But anyway, that's part of it. So wrapped in flesh. And when we look at Jesus, we see what God is like, full of grace and truth. As John says, no one has ever seen God. He refers to himself, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So all of a sudden, we can make God is known again. God was known in the garden. Then God wasn't known for centuries. And now, with the coming of a baby, God can be known again. See, the thought is that just as in Genesis, God is now walking with men and talking with them. They can see him face to face. They can touch him. As a young Christian, I would think, what a privilege it must have been to be around at that time to see Jesus. If only I could have touched him or just seen him or talked to him. I used to get really excited about that thought. But there's actually a fulfillment of God with us. You see, God is coming to restore oneness, but there's more oneness than even at the time of Jesus. You see, this is our oneness journey that you can see behind us. And just a quick review, we looked at this before. So we were created for oneness with God, weren't we? Then there was a broken oneness. Then there was this covenant community where God was running after us, looking to restore oneness with us. And that carried on all the way up to the beginning of the New Testament. And then what happens is we have Christ who comes to redeem oneness. And we'll hear the fulfillment of how he redeems oneness next week in the preach that comes then. But he's, in, my, in what my story today, he's come to redeem oneness. And so we have that in Matthew 1. And then we're also going to see that there's going to be a perfect oneness still to come. But, and there is a difference still. Let me just talk about this. There is a difference still. So let's imagine that we are with Jesus, as it were, over 2,000 years ago. We're walking with him. We're talking with him. You might think, well, I've seen God now. That's great. But, of course, what we have, Jesus has come as God, but he's still clothed in humanity. He's become in flesh. And for the first time in eternity, to live in among us. John says that we've seen his glory. But that glory is still hidden away. And just in case we don't get this, that some of his glory is still hidden away, there's a story in the Gospels, in three of the Gospels, about a time when Jesus and three of his disciples are with him, and Jesus is transfigured before them. It's a curious story. I'm just going to refer to it really briefly. It's a curious story. What happens is that his face shines like the sun, and his clothes become white as light for a period of time. Now, we, I'll just let you know, we now know this. We are 93 million miles from the sun, and yet we cannot look at it directly. So you imagine looking at the sun from two or three meters. I can't either. But such was the glory that was revealed that was to be on Jesus. Can I just tell you, if you think that there's a holy dissatisfaction in you that thinks this isn't all there is, I want to see more of Jesus, I have some good news for you. There is more. (laughs) There is more. I I would be really happy about that. (laughs) I'd be really happy. It's really, really good. And also after his resurrection, Jesus returns to the the Father. He prays this, actually. It's an interesting prayer, this, in John 17. He says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work to which you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence and the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So there's another glory to come back. Third Third thing, I'm moving on quickly in this. Through our story, Jesus is king. 
Other accounts of Jesus' birth are explicit about Jesus' kingship. Matthew's gospel has Magi come in from the east saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? They bring gifts for royalty, gold, which we saw on the stage today. How significant was that? The prophets too, they speak of a ruler from the line of David, a royal one for whom the way must be prepared. John says that, prepare the highway for the king to come on. But what of John's account? Well, John speaks a lot of glory. And there's an amazing prophetic song in Psalm 24, which I believe is partially fulfilled, and maybe further fulfillment partially fulfilled in what Jesus came and was doing. It's this, it's in Psalm 24, it says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Then there's this question, who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And the same refrain, who is this King of glory? Then he goes and answers that, the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Yeah, well, let's get excited. But let's, let's dwell on the significance of some of these words for a second. You see, when Charles is going to be crowned king a little bit later on this year, he's going to be crowned king of the UK. That's it. That's it. <laughs> this is the king of all glory. Now, if that doesn't cause us to worship, glory, all glory. Think about that. That's his title, not king of a country. It says king of kings, but that's one of his titles, but the king of glory. Now, we could say some rulers have an element of their glory, this glorious reign. We use that word, don't we? But this is the king of glory. Do you get the difference? The king of glory. Now, there are ancient gates and doors. There's a picture which will come up behind me, which is a fulfillment of this. It was of gates. These are gates in Jerusalem. You see, what happened as part of Jesus, before Jesus' Passover, before his death, which is what we'll be looking at more next week, Before that time of Jesus' death, what happened was that Jesus came into Jerusalem. He rode into Jerusalem, it says, on a donkey. He rode into Jerusalem. And this was in part a a fulfillment of this word. And it happened on the Sabbath prior to Passover. Now, what was significant about that Sabbath prior to Passover? It was when families would significantly set apart a Passover lamb. All right, I'm not going to go there, but that was the Sunday the Sabbath, when they were set apart a Passover lamb. Of course, it was a Passover lamb going into Jerusalem. Jesus goes from the Mount of Olives and he enters Jerusalem by the Eastern Gate. It's also known as the Golden Gate. And what happened is the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they'd seen. And he said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory. We got our word in. <laughs> glory in the highest. So here's the king. Here's the glory. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd got really upset and he said, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus says, look, look if they're not shouting glory, these stones are going to get busy. All of eternity is here. There's something something bigger than just coming into a city here happening. And what happens is that he went into Jerusalem. Now also recorded in that time, just a few verses on in uh, Luke 19, it says that that was when he wept as well over the city. And he said, oh, that you had ever known on this day the things that make for peace. And now they're hidden from your eyes. Remember, Jesus is our peace. He makes peace but also the things that make for peace. He needs to be received. Jesus, we need to receive Jesus. What's interesting is that Jesus um, didn't go through the gate and onto Herod's palace. Now, I, I haven't got a map up behind me with Jerusalem, but if you go through the Golden Gate, if you carry straight on, you'd actually go towards Herod's palace. And Herod's palace was, of course, the seat of government. So what did Jesus do? He didn't go to Herod's palace. He didn't go to 
usurp the seat of government as many wanted Jesus to do that. He wanted them to shock and awe, stamp his foot and turn everything up and down. And Jesus did turn everything up and down, but he turned everything up and down in a different place. Jesus turned left. He turned into the temple. He went into the temple courts. In other words, he went to the house of God. He went to the church. He went to the equivalent of us. And what he did was he did turn things upside down there. Goes on a little bit further. He says he turned out the money changers and said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And I think it's so significant that this weekend that we're doing prayer and fasting, that this is a house of prayer, that we're set, we're set aside this weekend as a house of prayer. Also, what happens is when Jesus comes into the house, things do get upset. Um, uh, Ola's word, I just want to say thank you for your word. The other day on Friday night, there was an upsetting in Ola's word, wasn't there? And I think that, for those who are here, and I think also in that, God will upset things when he comes. When he speaks to us, he will upset things. And Jesus comes into the church. He comes into this redeemed community. Those who receive the right to be the children of God, the living temple and the holy people, when he comes as our king. My prayer is that we recognize the time of our visitation, as Jesus said. That we go for the things that make for peace. That we are the house of prayer. That we receive him and we welcome the king of glory and we praise him as he comes in. As we close, I believe we're going to go back to a time of worship. But I just say, let's, as we do this, I'd just like the band yet to come up. As we do this, just introduce this. If I can prophesy, God's coming as king to his church. And for some of us, he's, I believe, as, as was prophesied, he's going to upset tables. He's going to rearrange things. The furniture is going to be really messy. That he's going to put things in order. He's going to call us back to prayer. He's going to call us back to oneness. He's going to call us to himself. And there's going to be an increase of his word among us. There's going to be an increase of his presence among us. But that's because there's going to be an increase of his kingship among us. And our response is to say, Lift up these gates, lift up these ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. So Father, we worship you, we glorify you, we say welcome to your church, welcome to our hearts, welcome, come on in, amen.